Good evening. My name is Marie Garvey, and on behalf of the whole Ocean Avenue Project team, thank you so much for coming out tonight to learn about the project and to be part of this process. We think we have a great project, but we think you could make it better with your input, and we look forward to hearing about it. So I'm joined here tonight with Jeff Worth from Worth Real Estate Group, Frank Geary from Geary Partners, and Tensho Takamore. Yes, I got it. Uh, <laughs> from Geary Partners. Um, Tonight is one of the first community meetings where the format has changed and the city's not running it, but the project's running it. So um, we're going to do the whole presentation. We're going to answer all the questions. Uh, we announced three weeks ago, as you know, and we wanted to make sure that we talked to the community right away with the community meeting. We're going to have dozens of them, even more than that, probably. And it's important that you're part of this process, and um, we want to get through everybody tonight. We're going to start with um, a presentation so you understand the project and the elements and the design and what all went into all this hard work. And then we're going to turn it over to Q&A where we're going to have you line up. We'll move the camera and move up the microphone and we'll take as many questions as you can. And I'll run through that again after the presentation is over. But the library closes at 9 tonight, so we have to be done at 8.45. So we're going to try to get to everybody. Um, if for some reason we can't get through everybody, what we ask is you go outside and sign up again. For, and we'll personally contact you when the next community meeting is coming, so we make sure that you guys get the time you deserve, okay? All right, thank you again for coming, and I'll turn it over to Jeff. Thanks for coming, good evening. Um, we're gonna start, most of you probably know the site, but I just wanted to go through this. this. This is the site here in blue, at the corner of Santa Monica Boulevard and Ocean Avenue. It's just about two acres of land. Um, this original site here, the larger rectangle uh, our family has owned since the late 70s and then in about 2007 we purchased this portion here as well to make up the balance um, it's probably about that time that we started to think about what we were going to do with the site I think the advent of both the loose and the downtown specific plan got us thinking as well as to what this site should be and you know we think it's a pretty special site you know, I think others do as well. The Loose identifies a key investment site. Downtown Plan has talked about opportunity sites. This is one of those. And so we thought it deserved something special. And we frankly thought that this firm is about as special as an architectural firm you could find um, in the world. And it just happens that they have to be located. Frank is a resident of Santa Monica, as am I. So we thought it would be a perfect marriage. Uh, sure. Sorry about that. I'm usually never told I'm too quiet. <laughs> Yeah, I always wanted to be an American Idol. <laughs> Go to the next slide. Project team you've heard about, um, as I mentioned before, um, Gary Partners actually had to move out of Santa Monica, their offices, because they outgrew their building. Um, but, uh, but Frank is a, is a resident. Our firm has been based here in Santa Monica since 1978. Uh, I live here in Santa Monica as well. The basic program that we came to Gary Partners with is we said the following. We said we have a site here. We actually had to apply to get them. We had to send in an application, so to speak, for them to consider the project. And so I said what we wanted to accomplish was a 125-room hotel. 125 rooms is actually the smallest we could build per the hotel industry and still make it a, a, a hotel that operates at an efficient level. Uh, we want to do something significant and cultural, and we'll, you'll hear more about the museum aspect of this tonight. We had retail and restaurant space on the ground floor, which is in line with what goes on in the downtown. We want to replace all 19 of our existing residential rent-controlled units. So all 19 of those units are, are proposed to be back in the project. We added five affordable rental units and 22 condominiums. So that's the program that we gave them to fit onto the site. Obviously, I mentioned the loose. We're following it and we're watching it and we're, try and we're incorporating as much of it as, as we understand and we can into the project. The next slide is the goals of the downtown specific plan, which is even more recent. And I can tell you that we went to their office once this was published. These are the top 10 topics that came out of the community meetings for the DSP. And we told them that all 10 of these needed to be incorporated in this project. And I think later on, Tensha will kind of talk through how all of these were incorporated. 
And I'll turn it over to Frank. Wow. That quick. <laughs> um, so I, I haven't done much in Santa Monica except my house. Um, partly because the people that came with projects um, weren't people that were interested in making buildings that I would call architecture. And so there hasn't been much of that in Santa Monica, my opinion. Um, this, uh, Jeff came, his, uh, B B Mr. Paul, is, you're related to him some way. Yeah. <laughs> it's his father-in-law, I think, <laughs> is on the board of the LA Phil with me, or has been in the past. And uh, they're very, in the family's very involved with cultural issues and, and, and um, we spent a lot of time talking about the potential of this and what it meant. I mean, it's not that it had to be more expensive. Uh, it just had to be better thought out and better considered and, uh, and treated like something special. So um, he, he did put his money where his mouth is and we've got, Tensha will show you, tons of models and studies we've done to get to this point. Now this is not a finished building, so I, I believe some people think they, that we're all done. We're not all done. Uh, these are just ideas, but uh, we've, the placement of the building, the relationship to the, uh, to the city and the other, other buildings, the sculptural relationship between these are something that we've considered. We know that this guy, when it was built, blocked the city. We're trying to keep keep it open. So uh, the idea of the the exterior, and uh, we have 30 models, uh, but we got there. They all are. <laughs> um, and the layout has gone through a lot of iterations, and it's it's not done, and we're not sure of the exterior materials. We've made the models white. If you look at the city, um, the aerial photo of the city, everything is white. So maybe it, it should do that, and maybe not. And those are things, uh, I'm not going to make it red or black, <laughs> but it may be softer, it may be a combination, of, depends on the materials. Uh, it, we've looked at uh, a white stone that comes from uh, Portugal. We've looked at uh, uh, making it all a glass building, uh, with, uh, which has frit, so it would look white. Uh, and we're trying to give it character. So the models you see are not finished, especially the ground floor stuff. Um, how that looks right now in these pictures it's just blocky and, and not, and, and believe me, it'll get more sculptural, more uh, nicer <laughs> as we go along. So um, I, I think Tencho maybe can explain the details of it, and then you guys can ask questions of me. <coughs> Not kind of quite as good with the mic. So in our design process, each project we start with, we always build a lot of these, uh, these block models. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. And the purpose of each of these block models is to figure out the organization of the program so that it functionally works, but also to be able to test the relationship of that massing against the context. And so we've gone through a ton of them, as Frank showed you. We've gone through a lot of different ones. We've looked at short ones, tall ones, wide ones, narrow ones, uh, to arrive at the current proposal of where we're at right now. And what I'll do is I'll go through and summarize. We can kind of summarize our current response in three very, very general ideas. So the first one is the relationship to 
the two historic landmark buildings. On the northern part of the site, there's a Spanish colonial, which is located here. And there's a Victorian, which is located actually right now, right next to it. Uh, and what we're proposing is to move it to the north part of the site here. It would be directly adjacent to another landmark Victorian, the Gussie Moran House. And we would then build a third building in the back, a new building designed by us. And these three buildings would be set in a publicly accessible open space and would form the basis of a museum campus. They'd also be combined with a lower level, gallery level that would be the full footprint of this area underneath all three of these buildings. And what we really wanted to find was a meaningful way to have adaptive reuse of the landmarks. And what this allows these two landmark buildings is to participate in a larger museum. It would be 36,000 square feet. And we could put certain functions of the museum. Examples might be the bookstore or the cafe or some of the meeting rooms. And they could participate in a different way and wouldn't be forced to have, say, large, open, wide gallery spaces. Uh, then uses could be more uh, coincident with what the existing layout is. I'll talk a little bit more about the site design later on. So this is a rendering of the view looking down ocean and you see the the new building on the corner in the distance and then you see the Spanish colonial and then you see the Victorian move next to the Gussie Moran and then in between would be a park that would lead to the museum entrance of the building in the back. And the museum is not designed, it's just an idea of approximate the scale of the building that we'd be considering so that it represents a good relationship to the two historic landmark buildings. So the second point is the prevailing context. And you can see really from this model that the prevailing height in downtown are buildings that are approximately two to four or five stories tall. And this is really what defines the pedestrian experience as you're walking on the sidewalks, the access to sunlight, the, the size of the shop fronts, et cetera. So it was very important to us, as you can see, to create a base around our site of buildings that were similarly scaled in height. So all of these, the street front edges relate in a very specific way to the buildings adjacent to them. And there's a two to four story band, you can see this is a view down Santa Monica Boulevard, ocean looking up, no, ocean to the north on the left. And you can see the scale of the buildings that are on the street front varying from about two to four stories. We've also broken down the scale so it's not a solid wall along the whole block. That's what each of those blocks represent. They're breaking down the scale so that it relates more to the, the buildings adjacent to it. And as Frank mentioned, it's not designed. Even on the bottom here, we're just showing some ideas that we've had different ways that we've looked at the storefront. Uh, the building would be more sculptural on the bottom. But some of the ideas we're looking at is perhaps the window fronts could be operable so that they could open up and you could get a better connection between the pedestrian outside area and the activities to the inside. This is a review just uh, to summarize the ground floor uses as a ground floor plan. On the left side in the pink, you can see this is the museum campus. The yellow color on the uh, southwest corner of the site here is restaurant area. The blue area in between the two, this is the entrance location, location for the hotel. On the back part of the site, Santa Monica and Second, the yellow area would be additional retail area, similar types of retail that might connect it to areas of Third Street Promenade. And the purple area in the top is the entrance to the rental housing, the replacement apartments, and the affordable units uh, that Jeff mentioned earlier. This diagram flips it, and we're now showing you an idea just to talk through the idea of the site plan. One of the first ideas we, did, we had was to take the traffic that currently do comes down first court and to turn it on our property in a new alley that would go out to second street. What this does in combination with removing the entrance to the parking lot to the parking lot on 2nd. There is also traffic that comes out of the alley onto Santa Monica Boulevard. And there's also an entrance to an existing parking lot on Ocean Avenue. And what we've done is this concept, all access to below grade parking would be off the alley and off 2nd Street. And now we have a continuous frontage coming down Santa Monica Boulevard all the way along Ocean Avenue which is uninterrupted by any vehicular crossings, which we think would create a much better pedestrian experience. 
In addition, what we've done is set the building back five feet from the property, long, property line along Santa Monica Boulevard and Ocean Avenue to create a wider pedestrian experience. In addition, you can see the building's articulated, so it steps back in other areas even wider. And so this creates, uh, the downtown specific plan talks about a planting and furnishing zone along the edge of the curb, then there's a walking zone, and then there's a shop front zone, which could be areas, for example, we're showing cafe tables, but areas for outdoor dining, et cetera. So it's a much more wider and better pedestrian experience along both of these streets. Finally, in connecting to those, that, that sidewalk experience, we've created an idea of paseos. And starting on the northern part of the site, you can see that there is a paseo that connects from the sidewalk to the museum entrance. There's another one adjacent between the Colonial and the new building, which connects back to a landscape courtyard for one of the restaurants, and there are restaurants opening onto this one. The muse you can see the hotel entrance here off of Ocean. And what we've done with the alley is we're turning the traffic out to 2nd Street, but the easement for the utilities would remain there. And so we're taking this as an opportunity to create a new pedestrian experience. Shop fronts could open to this, and the connection would be at the back of the hotel. There's a lobby there which leads to an observation deck on the top of the building, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. Finally, off of 2nd Street, you can see there's an entry courtyard. This is the entry for the, the apartments, which are located on the 2nd Street part of the site. Third item is if you look at Ocean Avenue, there are buildings with varying heights along it. So there is a precedent to consider buildings with taller height. Now what we did was carefully consider a very small footprint. It occupies only 12% of the total site area in which to build taller height of the project. Now we have an opportunity here on this site because it's 11 lots is that we can position the taller portion of the building away from the street fronts on all edges. And it's been organized into a very narrow building you can see in the north-south direction. So the long direction is in the east-west direction which is to preserve the views to all of our neighbors to the east to the ocean. It's also been weighted more towards Ocean Avenue where the buildings are taller, which allows the building along 2nd Street to be lower in scale and similar in scale and character to the other buildings along 2nd Street. So some of the key facts that I know you'll be interested in, the building in total is 22 stories tall. It's 244 feet to the roof and the FAR for the site is just over 2.6. This is a view of 2nd Street and Santa Monica Boulevard. And here, this is again showing it's not designed, as Frank has said, but it shows an idea with shop fronts along 2nd Street. And the scale of the buildings, you can kind of understand how it relates to the existing buildings along 2nd Street. In addition, you can see the tower in the background. It's a narrow profile in the north-south direction and how it creates still wide areas of open views uh, for their neighbors to the east. This is a view from 3rd Street Promenade looking west along Santa Monica Boulevard. And this starts to summarize the overall contextual response. You can see the lower part of the building, the base relating to the lower parts of other buildings, the mid step back relating to buildings of mid height adjacent to us, and then the taller portion of the building as it relates to other tall buildings adjacent to us. The top, as I said, is we're going to have a public observation deck, which is accessed off that lobby from the alley. Uh, the idea is that there's not really an experience where people can have like this, to go to the top of the building on the west side and have a great view. And it really makes, in our opinion, the height of the building a public amenity. So a little summary about where all the, the different pieces of the program are. So here's a site plan. So this area here, Again, on the northern part of the site is the museum campus. This area on the ground floor would be predominantly uh, housing restaurants. This area on the eastern part of the site would be retail. This pink area would be where the apartments would be, 19 replacement units and the five affordable units. Off the entry, you can see in the center, uh, residents would come up to a private courtyard on the second floor. And from this courtyard, they would access the corridors to their apartments. Uh, the blue color represents the footprint of the hotel, which starts at the second level and goes to the 10th floor. 
The green represents the condominiums which start at the 11th floor, go to the 22nd floor, and on the roof, the pink area, is the observation deck. So this is a final view. Uh, we think that our response at where we're at right now, it affords you know, three very strong characteristics, which is to reinforce the pedestrian experience, uh, to respect the scale of the adjacent buildings and the character along 2nd Street, and it allows us to create a good scale response to the landmark buildings and incorporate them in a significant cultural amenity. So next we're talking about um, transportation. Tencho mentioned how we're eliminating all the vehicle access off of Santa Monica and Ocean, which um, is purely to enhance the pedestrian experience around the site. We obviously think we're building something people are going to want to come to see, like a museum. We want to make that experience easier and more enjoyable um, to have. This project will certainly participate in the transportation demand management plan, which will be part of the development agreement process that um, will help focus on trip reduction measures, working with the employees at the project and their commuting patterns. Um, obviously, the bike community is a big part of Santa Monica, and that's got to be integrated into this project as well. Go ahead. Oh, one thing I wanted to mention, I think we skipped over it. We are um, proposing to build 460 parking stalls underground. I don't think we talked about that, but that came out of, that number's higher than the figure that we received from a parking demand study that the project uh, had gone through. And that all these, all the information that we may reference in reports and stuff is available to anybody who would like to see it. These are the, the, the top 10 lists I mentioned earlier. This came, you know, this is a, a list of topics that have come out of the various workshops on the downtown specific plan. And the goal here is to incorporate all 10 of these into this project. Um, we could talk further about it, but I think if you go down the list, you'll see that we uh, attempted to incorporate all of them in here. Next slide is just is a study that uh, PKF did for the project, just to look at the economic benefits of the project, both in terms of tax revenues to the city of Santa Monica and the indirect and direct spending um, that'll be that'll come from this project. In addition, there's a, a, a job figure uh, once this project is built of the, the number of jobs that'll be uh, on the site. And finally, the last slide that I have is, you know, this is a long process. You guys are actually at our first community meeting, um, March of 2013. It's the third bullet point, but there's a lot, a lot more bullet points than one slide could hold. So we want you to understand that we don't take lightly bringing a project like this to the city. Um, we think we've, we've done a, a really good job to get to this point, and a lot of thoughts gone into it, but we appreciate that this is a community process, and we need to hear and, and, and work with the community to make this project better. So I think our current thinking, and it's all estimated because we don't control calendars of, of the different processes, but this, our goal is to get into the float up process sometime in the summer or fall um, of this year. And we're going to have a lot of community meetings before that, and we'll have a lot of community meetings after that. So um, the rest of the dates are kind of become irrelevant because it really all triggers off the beginning. But the only point I'm trying to make is we expect this to be a, an involved process and a long process, and that's what um, we're prepared to do. Is that our last slide? All right, so we'll start the Q&A process and what we thought, we'll raise up the um, mics. My only question for now, because <laughs> I think that even enhances the wonderful architecture that's uh, evolving here as well. The, the Ficus trees on 2nd Street, Jerry? Absolutely. Once we fix the sidewalk that they've dug up, <laughs> we could keep those trees. Good. That's it for now. Thanks. I have lived for 30 years in Santa Monica, so I feel being a Santa Monican. Uh, I think that I got you. You want to move New York to Santa Monica. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, no questions. Hi, Tom Tyholtz. I'm a Santa Monica resident, and I work on, uh, in Santa Monica. My office is on 4th Street between Broadway and, and Santa Monica Boulevard, and I'm a journalist. Um, and my question is about the cultural space and the public art. Could you uh, talk more about that and what your plans are for that? 
So the, the museum, which is 36,000 square feet with the two existing landmark buildings plus a new, a new building, um, is in its early stages. I mean, what we're proposing, we think Gary Partners has a pretty good history with museums. And obviously, a museum uh, done by this firm will hopefully um, attract the kind of, kind of institution that we expect to have at this project. But it's early in the stages on the museum. I don't know where Tom went. Um, there's, it's early in the stages on the museum as to, to announce what it's going to be. But the goal is for it to be a museum, as we all can think of, a museum like these folks have uh, participated in previously. Good evening. My name is Mary Marlowe. I'm an Ocean Park resident. Um, you talked about buying the site in 2007 on Ocean. There was a development agreement at that time. Uh, what happened to that? And why isn't uh, that being looked at? That was for a four-story hotel. Yes, the, 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 the three lots. We had eight lots originally from the late 70s. The three lots that we added was, were approved for a 73-room hotel. Uh, the two landmark buildings were incorporated into that. The answer is we let that expire. It, it wasn't a project that um, we were going to pursue. And candidly, the entire museum campus is that project today. So we converted the 73 motel into the museum campus. Just to comment, sure, um, the downtown plan is not final. And there is no height limit right now. Uh, but it's certainly not going to be 22 stories. So um, I think that's important for everybody to know up front. Sure. No, I think it's a great point. I think the um, planning process is involving because the downtown plan is not finalized. So we've been trying to follow the process and, and, and design as, as it's developing. Uh, my name is John Enright. I'm a resident of Santa Monica. I, I just wanted to say this is one of the most fantastic presentations I've seen. I'm also an architect too, but um, <laughs> uh, when an architect builds, you know, 25 percent of the city uh, to see how they're building and, and, and obviously the client, this is just amazing. I mean, uh, uh, we all know your work and uh, you know, I've always felt you were a contextual architect and an urbanist, and this is absolute proof of this. Um, so many levels, amazing project. Um, uh, the amenities, the, the museum. Uh, the black building, and it stands out, and it looks stupid. So and <laughs> behind us is a brown building. But um, that's, you know, we'll, we'll usually what we do is make big mock-ups. So we'll have full-scale mock-ups over at my my place or probably on the site huh full real scale but we it, it's going to be substantial material it's not going to be uh, anything cheesy <laughs> thank you hi my name is Karim Zaman I'm an Ocean Avenue uh, homeowner and on the board of directors of uh, building up the street ocean in uh, Montana. Um, very honored to have uh, the renowned Frank, Frank Gary uh, doing a building uh, just down the street. Um, my question is uh, the Fairmont has an ambitious uh, project of mixed use and open uh, uh, shops and, and things. Is there any uh, timeline coordination? Will these is the proposed timeline going to be similar? Is there going to be construction at the same time? Is is there any coordination with that project? I know it's a separate project, but you can take. It. Yeah, no, they're 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 separate projects, as you said. And candidly, I don't know one timeline. I certainly don't know ours. Okay. <laughs> so I certainly don't know theirs. Okay. And and I, I think um, you know we'd, we'd have to. We both have a long way to go before we could even have that conversation. It's probably mm -hmm. not a bad idea to to think about, but we're not having those conversations today. Yeah. We, we were next door to the uh, Oceana Hotel. Sure. And um, when, uh, when uh, the um, sewer, um, tr uh, I can't think of what it's actually called, but it was a, it was a lot of construction that was done um, for a catch basin for the sewer. And right after that, then the Oceana took an, you know, another year or so to, to be completed. So um, just for, you know, being a resident on Ocean Avenue, I think that would be important to, to have some coordination with okay. Fairmont. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Liz Bell. I live, um, I guess, arguably downwind of you. 
uh, <laughs> on the inland side. I have concerns about the increasing um, Manhattanization, the Miami Beach um, process of what's happening on the ocean front, as well as my, one of my major concerns is, is blocking these sea breezes, uh, which doesn't look like maybe that's going to happen very much. But I actually have a friendly question. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to take it? No, this is for Frank Gehry. Um, this is an iconic piece of architecture. We have the ocean sails downtown at Disney Hall. What on earth are you, did you design here? I can guess that this has something to do with the beach and the waves lapping against the shore, but I'd like to hear from you. I don't think we've heard what, what you actually had in mind with this, with well, the wavy, I, I the wavy architecture. I don't <laughs> think about it that way. When I did Disney Hall, uh, the front sort of, I'm a sailor sometimes, and I thought of wing on wing, and. But that was after the fact, so uh, I'm not, you know, I, I read and I look at stuff, so I, there's a lot in here, but uh, it does look like a wavy stuff. I, I was... Some I was, would say it makes us seasick, but <laughs> <laughs> I'd like was, to have a nicer... It's view. very hard to give humanity to a building, very hard, especially a commercial building that has the, the constraints, the economic constraints that a commercial building has. And so the windows, you've got the skin and the windows, and uh, the building I did in Manhattan, 76 stories, the, the skin has a, a flow, like a fabric, and those became bay windows. So when you go in the apartment, you look out, the, you walk toward the window, it's, you're looking, you feel like you're walking in space. Uh, there, there is a, a lot of study work to be done on how the windows relate to the exterior skin. And the idea that they're not all on the same plane is something we're studying. So that to create a, a not level plane that allows us to, to move in and out and create a, dif a differentiating differentiation of window types so that it doesn't, so that becomes more of a, a composition that does a lot to humanizing the appearance of the building. So it's not just a modern slab glass, you know, faceless in the most cases. And you've seen them all over the world. Everybody builds that. Uh, and so I'm trying not to. <laughs> okay, thank you. thank you. Good evening, my name is John Murdoch. Uh, I moved to Santa Monica in 1970. Uh, I live in the uh, Sunset Park area now. I had an office two blocks from your site there, and I watched things develop over the last 40 years. It's become increasingly congested, as you know. And the, the issue that I, would like to bring up, when I saw your top 10 list, there was no item or bullet point about the height. In other words, there is an existing height limit in this district, is there not? Mm -hmm. And it's about four stories, correct? Mm -hmm. So why aren't we living and building an iconic structure within the four-story limit and keeping the traffic in a manageable level? I mean, given the, the history that happened with the Mace Rich Tower, I think we should start with that concept and then see if everybody wants a bigger story building, well, you might bend your will to that, but I think we start with the zoning as it is, don't we? Instead of coming in with a 22-story building and then getting approval for it and then changing the law, is that how it's going to happen? No, we certainly aren't intending to change the law. The, um, the first point, there is existing height limit. What's being proposed, the top 10 list we didn't create. So when you ask why height wasn't there, that's not a list that we created. That came out of the downtown plan. So why that wasn't on that, you have to ask them. It wasn't our list. We just tried to follow it. Um, what is going on in the city now is a proposal to look at certain sites, very few, to give them flexibility. So we're just following that. Right. Well, I, I understand there are, they're developing a specific plan, and there is a nebulous concept called opportunity sites. And this is one of them. So 
Uh, my question is, how did it get to be, quote, unquote, an opportunity site? And secondly, you mentioned the word, there are precedents for tall stories. Those tall stories were built before the, the height limit went into effect that we have now. So as I follow the law, you know, the height limit is the will of the people on what they want in the area. So you shouldn't pr point to other taller buildings that were built before what the people decided they wanted to keep the limits small. And using that word precedent is extremely dangerous because if this one is built, who's the next guy? Who's going to come up and say, well, look at that precedent. Why can't I build 20 stories? And then it's bam, 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 right down Ocean Avenue. I don't think that's what we want. Thank you. I appreciate your comments. You asked the, another question I wanted to answer. We didn't, I don't know what, how they determined opportunity sites. It, we, you couldn't apply for it. They just, it came out and we were one of them. So I don't know the background on that. Thank you. But thanks for your comments. I've got a question about the circulation. Mm -hmm. I noticed on the picture where you were showing the traffic accessing parking that it was coming down first court and also being accessible off second. I was wondering how the circulation will work during ingress and egress of an event. I, I don't see the traffic moving as smoothly as one might like for large numbers of people arriving or trying to leave at the same time. Sure. Um, and I guess we'd probably have to think of the context of a large event for a hotel this size because it's actually yeah. quite small. Yes. And I, I recognize that it's relatively small for a large hotel, but imagine some kind of amazing, fabulous, wonderful museum opening at the same time someone who is a high-end person <laughs> is having a wedding. Sure. I think the um, first question you asked, as far as the access points, there's two. For the apartment units in the, on 2nd Street, they have an access point off of 2nd. The rest of the traffic is picked up on Ocean Avenue and brought down the alley, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. As far as all the, you know, as far as things that you're specifically talking about, what, what kind of impact could be if two events were occurring, I think all that would be studying the AR. Mm -hmm. So I, I couldn't answer it now because yeah. we haven't gone through that but, yet. But, but uh, what, as I see that, that's one of the first things I notice is how space gets used. How is it accessed? How is it left? Uh, I do like the fact that you've dramatically reduced the, the number of alleys and increased that whole frontage. That looks great, but I don't want to have to approach it only by helicopter. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. Good evening. Uh, question for Mr. Gary. My name is John C. Smith, and I'm a teacher and a former news producer. I wanted to, if I could, follow up on a question that this gentleman raised. You know, this is, thank you for being here. You know, it's an impressive design, and coming from you, I would expect nothing less. Uh, clearly, it's an impressive design. If the citizens and city leaders of Santa Monica, Santa Monica came to you and said, Mr. Gary, we like your project. We just want a shorter version of it. What would be your answer to that? Well, it would depend. Uh, we did study earlier, and when when uh, Mayor Genser, I think, was still around. Ken Genser, yes. Ken, and showed smaller and lower buildings at that time with him, and nobody liked nobody in, that we met with at that time. We didn't meet with. We didn't have public meeting, hearings, but it, they did. It's pretty difficult to to do something special with that profile. You can do it. I mean, I've made a, got everybody excited about a house that's only two stories, but yeah. uh, <laughs> so it can be done. It's just, it's just not a pro forma that's gonna allow uh, uh, th this kind of development, which brings uh, jobs and revenue to the city and and when you do that there's a trade-off and I think that that the, the idea of opportunity sites seemed brilliant to me that it didn't open the door to what this gentleman was saying that everybody was going to do one as long as you stick to that game plan and you place them well I think you, you've got a chance of having your cake and eating it now God bless you if you 
don't want it to be that high, you know, we'll talk about it. But you know, in the news business, we usually get a follow-up. Just a quick one. If there, if there was <laughs> question one and a half, one and a quick, yeah. So you know, apparently there was a four-story project there planned a long time ago, and that went that went away, and now we have a 22-story. Isn't there a you know certainly, Mr. Gary, you're the world's most renowned architect. You could find some kind of a middle ground there. I mean, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. I, I think the just to a, oh. clarify, the four-story project was never was not on our site. It was a site that we had acquired. Um, but but it's a great question. Listen, I think there's a lot of factors. The FAR is 2.6. Okay, so it's not a it's not a large project. What, what comes with what's, what's driving the taller portion of this project is a combination of things. It's certainly the museum and the open space. And it's certainly the second street, the context of the second street portion of the project. So when you put all those factors together, this is what we have we've have come up with. But I appreciate your, your question. Hi. Hi, um, my name is Lynn Wall, and I live in um, Wilmont section of um, Santa Monica, not too far from, I go by your house a lot, and, <laughs> and actually wish that you could design something like your house on that site that would work for Mr. Worth and, and his investors. But um, my question is, I'm an accountant, and it's actually not geared, to, geared towards Mr. Gary, but towards Mr. Worth. Um, I don't understand the parking and the number of people issue. Um, from the standpoint that you said you are planning on being able to employ 1,300 and some amount of people, and that doesn't include the guests in the hotel, the visitors to the museum, the people in the retail stores, the people in the restaurants, and the people in the condos. And so I'm just wondering how 400 and 60 parking places work, and I, I, sure. I know you have a consultant who told you it will work, <coughs> but I'm wondering um, <laughs> exactly, um, you know, what is the traffic mitigation plan that will accommodate, you know, 1,800 people or 2,000 people in 400 parking spots? Yeah, first off, um, and that's why we have an EIR process for sure, but first off, 1,300 people don't all work at the same hour. Mm -hmm. Hotels a 24-hour business. Mm -hmm. Restaurants are from morning to late in the night. So I think you have to look at it that way. Yeah, but that I would, piece. frankly, I do think you, you would probably be better off reviewing that report and asking us questions then because I think that would give us both a better chance to address your, your question. But that's the first thought that I had on it. Okay. That they don't, they're not all working there at 4 o'clock. Right. So you don't know what your FTEs would be, your full-time equivalents, uh, as far as the work At any one moment? Yeah. No. Okay. No. Thank all you. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Kathy Boole. Um, I'm a talent agent. I've lived in Santa Monica most of my life. I'm also a writer, and I'm also an architectural junkie, and I'm thrilled that Santa Monica is getting a Frank Gehry project. Absolutely thrilled. <laughs> um, I have actually visited Frank Gehry projects or buildings in many parts of the world, and I think just from the look of this that I think the people that are worried that it's going to be a big hulking monster of a building I think that you would find if it takes up 12% of this lot um, on its base that it's not going to be something that blocks out anything and in fact making it higher will actually make it more delicate. And so, and, and it sounds like it's going to, I know you don't know what's co what color it's going to be, but it sounds like it's going to be a light color or somehow oceanic. Um, reflecting the reason that people come down to this area is to look out and see the moving water and the building is going to re kind of reflect the moving water. Not literally, but it's going to, in design, reflect it. So I ju anyway, I just have one really simple question, um, and that is, is there going to be a space um, between the sidewalk and the curb for a green belt? Because I think that's really important to the look of a project, that it's not completely cement going straight up to the street. No, absolutely. The, there, the areas, as I said, we've set back the... Uh, the building five feet to create a wider sidewalk, but the, uh, they're developing some planning goals where there is a, a zone of, I think, four or five feet that's from the curb inward, and they call it a furnishing and planting zone, and then there's a walk zone, and then there's the storefront zone. So there'd be an area, basically, to landscape around the whole perimeter between traffic and where people are walking. Great. Thanks. 
Hello, my name's the Star and the Arrow, and I've taken an architectural design class at SMC, and I really enjoy it, so I can understand a little bit about the, the joys of creating something, because I drew my house, which I eventually will love. But <laughs> I have a question. You said about a game plan. The game plan here is four stories, and now we're not doing the game plan. So that I have a question with. I have an objection. Forget the question. We've already discussed that. Um, also with the traffic, I take the bus a lot or I bike. And on Ocean Boulevard, especially on the weekends and in the evenings, you cannot get through with the bus. It just takes so long. So that's more congestion there. And I know this is part of the city hall, um, the, the <coughs> council business that they, they're allowing a lot of development here. So I have an issue with all the development. Every time you break down a building, that has to go into a dump somewhere. And then when you build a new building, you have to get the materials out of the earth. So I want you to consider those things too. Um, I think that's just about it. Thank okay. you so much. You want to say mm -hmm. oh. Absolutely. You know, the construction industry uh, is waste, 30% and, and maybe 40%. So if you build a $100 million building, 30 to $40 million of it is waste and yeah multiply that by you talk about green and sustainability mm -hmm. that's a big big thing and we've been using a, a fancy computer thing for the last 10 or 15 years and we're we're we analyze carbon footprint as we go we analyze uh, we eliminate change orders which is part of 15 percent of the waste is change orders Mm -hmm. And uh, overmanaged is another five percent, and so there's a lot of stuff that we're looking at that deals with those kind of things. Uh, so I just want you to know that. Know what that you you you're aware that you're you're creating a lot of excess. No, we're eliminating a lot of. We're cutting the amount of waste in the building. Waste effort, waste time, waste materials. I was just, I thought you were just mentioning how much there is wasted. There is in the, in, the, in the world, in the construction industry. And I said, we're trying to deal with it. That's all I'm okay. saying. Okay. Okay. Thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hi. My name is Ajit Dige. I'm a, a practicing architect in Santa Monica. This is my 31st year of practice. So I've seen how Santa Monica has evolved. And a few years ago, at the Santa Monica Place, the Jody Partnership had recommended a scheme with three, I think there were 30-story condominium towers, three towers in, on that site. It was completely... I never did it. No, no, Jody, the Jody <laughs> Partnership. <laughs> no, not you. I know, I know your work, believe me. <laughs> no, the Jody Partnership. And the community completely rejected it and that's how you can see what we have today so here to see a 22-story tower I mean I work for Skidmore Owings and Merrill and that's all they did is build towers they were ugly boxes not like this what Frank does but 22 stories in our city is extreme if you drive on our streets Second Street Ocean Avenue Santa Monica Boulevard they're all parking lots already I mean, you talk about a 400-car garage, how do you get there? Every street is a parking lot. And that's a big problem right now in Santa Monica. I have nothing against big projects, but, mm -hmm. and, and for what Frank has done with, you know, smaller scale buildings like his Disney Concert Hall and some of his other projects, I'm sure he can do a beautiful sculptural project without 22 stories. He could do it in five stories, and that's a big site. It's not a small site that <coughs> justifies 22 stories. I mean. If, Maybe you can explain to me your rationale for it because you're, you're the expert on this one. <laughs> I don't, yeah, I don't know that, was there a question for me? I don't think so. Just, yeah, uh, let me just tell you this. I, Here's I the suggest. beauty of this process. This city actually has done a great job of creating a process. Mm -hmm. You have a voice in this thing. You know, we're only two votes, two residents here, yeah, right? There's 90,000 of us. Yeah. If the community doesn't want this, it's not gonna happen. Yeah. I'm just telling you, that's how it works. So, yeah. No, I'm just saying if you could do a four or five story <laughs> complex, which is still a sculpted piece of work that Frank is capable of doing, 
Sure. Then, be, unfortunately, you know, the pro this is the project with, with the total community benefit package that we're including, which we don't think a 36,000 square foot museum is insignificant effort on our part. It's certainly a costly measure. Yeah. I'm sorry, I was yeah. speaking to this gentleman. That's why we're here. We're saying we don't. We don't want to Go ahead. I think, anyway, um, um, I think we're going to take one question at a time, but I think the important point here for everyone is this is our first meeting. We felt strongly that we had to design a project that people could react to. We didn't want to come and talk in generalities and say, well, we're working on it. Um, we wanted to show you something that you can react to, and, and some people are reacting to it both positively and negatively, and that, that is why we're here. We want to get your feedback. And we want to go through this process. I think, though, from the presentation you saw, we, you know, we are trying to deliver maximum community benefits and try to deal with the height thoughtfully. And I think you can see in the presentation we gave how we came up with that plan. And we can all debate it. We have a long time. Trust me. <laughs> We're at the very beginning. And a lot of the questions we can't answer tonight because we still have to go through a traffic study, an ERR process that will address construction, waste, <laughs> traffic, all of those things that we will absolutely answer as soon as we have the answers. But tonight is the very beginning, and we encourage you to be involved in this process because, like we said, we think you can make a better project. But we put something out that we're really proud of. We think it's a great project, and, and we want you to react. So I think that's, the, that's our right, and that's your right, and we'd love to hear more. So next question. Hi, I'm Ellen Hannon, and I have been at many projects from Colorado Place up to the Miramar. And you force these things down our throats. I have been at these community meetings. St. John's parking structure never shows up. We don't believe in community benefits after being at meeting after meeting. My question, I want to start at the beginning, is with transparency. Mm -hmm. At what point in time did you in the city, give me a month and a date, did you in the city start talking about opportunity centers. I have been following the downtown plan, the loose plan. I just heard about it the last month. But you've got your opportunity center. I'm sure it took Mr. Geary, uh, I don't know how long it took Mr. Geary to put up this 22-story building. So I would like to know which came first, the chicken or the egg. Did you go to the Planning Commission and Ron Gould and say, I want to build a 22-story building? Give it to me. It doesn't fit in the loose, so okay, we'll call it an opportunity center. Or did Mr. Gould go to you and say, oh yeah, no problem. We'll give you an opportunity center. We want opportunity centers. Exactly when in the process did these opportunity centers come up? Where are they going? We have no idea where else you're going to be putting these things. So really, this is just a sham and a farce. Well, I'll, I'll let Jeff answer the timing, but I think it's important to note that in the loose plan, they did identify key investment sites was the term in the loose plan, and our site was a key investment site at that time. And then the, the term in the downtown specific plan discussions that are going on in the staff recommendations called opportunity sites. So that in our site is both. It was identified as both in both plans. Well, specific plan isn't a plan yet. It's just discussions. But So the loose plan identified the site as a key investment site, I think that carried over in the downtown specific plan, but I'll let Jeff respond to discussions with the city. We, we had no discussions with the city about opportunity centers, you call them opportunity sites. They determined those, and we reacted to that. So the city came to you and said, we want a 22-story no, building you, you here. Need to, the city has gone through their own process through the loose, which right. has been going on a long time. Right. They identified certain sites, and I, don't, I can't tell you all of them, as key investment sites. At what point in time did they do that? Can't tell you when the loose was adopted. You know. Does I, anyone know? No, no one knows. So. Yeah. 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 The loose was, but where, where in the loose were these these sites put, and where are the other places? I don't have the loose memorized. Yeah. You know, I don't. I. It's in there. It's a, yeah, I think that might be a question for the city. Uh, right. Again, we're we're the second meeting that's taken over from the city in leading these, and a lot of those questions are city questions. But I can tell you that when loose was, you know, finalized. They had key investment sites, and our site was one of those. But you don't know where the others are in relation I, to your I, property. No, I I don't, and I think there are some. There are definitely some in downtown, for sure, and um, you'd have to ask the city where all of them are. Miramar. Miramar's one, yeah. The Miramar one is also one. I think okay, that, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hi. How essential, Diana Gordon. How essential is it 
for you to have condos as part of this project? As part of this project, as we propose it, with the museum, it's essential. If you took away the museum, how essential is it to have the condos on it's, this project? You know, project? if we took away the museum, we'd go design a different project. So I, I, I'm, we're not, you know, I, I can't get my head around taking pieces of this off. I mean, as a fair answer to your question, it's a great question, but we'd have to go through and look at that project. Have you discussed with the city what it would cost for a city to maintain a museum that would be a museum, not a gallery, but an actual functioning 38,000 square foot facility in the kind of um, multi hundred, more than a hundred million dollar, I would think, um, uh, if you look at what's happening with MoCA. Sure. And, I mean, we, we all understand the, the kind of constraints we're under financially to even be able to keep a great museum in our city. So how are we looking at this museum as an essential part of a project to, to be able to drive the height up as, as high as, as sure. you're thinking? First off, the question you asked is, we talked, the city's not involved in the cost to build this or the cost to run it. We're building the museum, and we will bring in, at appropriate time, we're going to have further discussions with operators that will keep this museum operating. This is not a city burden. Uh, the last question I have for you, and this sure. is based on, there is another opportunity site where the Felcor uh, Trust is proposing uh, to uh, to do a site at the win what, what's now the Holiday Inn, but they have a, a, a major um, proposal too. And they indicated to us when we had a meeting that they had been working with the city on opportunity sites and they've been working with the city on determining what they thought were appropriate heights and densities for their site and attending meetings within the city on the downtown specific plan. Is that something that you and your team have also been doing is meeting on the downtown specific plan with the city? Well, with, with the specific folks of the downtown plan we have, and we've gone yeah. to community meetings as well. Have you seen any residents at those downtown specific plan meetings that you've gone to? Absolutely. Are you talking about the workshops or the, the actual? Workshops. yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. <clears throat> Hello, my name's Hank Koning. Um, I, I want to make a couple of comments, if I may. I was chair of the Planning Commission for eight and a half years going through the loose project process, and we had numerous community meetings talking about the various aspects of the city to create that plan. That plan was passed unanimously by the Planning Commission. It passed unanimously by the City Council. It does identify opportunity sites that were put forward. They were sites seen specifically as there's an opportunity to do something fantastic to give back to the community. How can we make it work? And we are very specifically in our, our uh, agenda of not putting in a height limit in the loose. We said that should be established in the downtown specific plan which is being worked out. So they're not trying to do anything um, outside of the law. They're not trying to hide anything. They're doing exactly, they're ex okay. No, I'm trying to give some background here that I'm trying to give some background into the situation as I have some knowledge about it that might help people understand the process that these guys aren't trying to do something that wasn't this is exactly what the loose wanted people to do now I want to make a comment there are comments people make about congestion and they can they're mixing up height and congestion a high building does not create more traffic Okay, well, the FAR of this project, this FAR of this project is 2.6. If you build a four-story building on 75% of the site, it's three. So it would have more floor area, more people in that, more traffic congestion. So I think we, we just have to remember that height does not translate into a bigger building. It may be, this is only 2.6 FAR. I think that's a very important thing to understand and the reason they're doing it is to get the light and air moving through it unlike some of these other buildings. I just wanted to clarify that because it didn't seem, I'm sorry if I'm lecturing, but some people didn't seem to understand that, that comment, that, uh, that oh, issue. So, <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, um, one of the things we said was that we wanted iconic architecture and I think you have delivered to us something that's very interesting and this is very much the spirit of what the loose wanted on an opportunity site, to have something that would 
create debate, discussion, and is interesting. So thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Hi, my name Hi. is Paul Rich. My mother moved here to Santa Monica in the 40s, and her first job was at the Miramar Hotel as a hairdresser, so mm -hmm. I have nothing against hairdressers, and I'm a fan of Frank Gehry. <laughs> But I'm not sure how those relate, but okay. <laughs> there's a but. Um, this is the first time I heard that uh, to turn a profit, a hotel had to have 125 rooms. So my question is, why would a hotel that had 124 rooms not turn a profit? <laughs> because of the staff level you have. Are you, where do you go? Sorry, sorry. Because the staffing level needed to operate a hotel, you've got the same number of employees if you have less guests. And a 125-room hotel obviously is not very large, but anything lower than that. And we have people tell us 125 is too small. So that's, you know, to answer your question is, I'm not sure 125 is the right number, but, you know, it's not 250. It's just that's the number that we settled on because with consultation. Because the staffing level doesn't change whether you have 100, 100 rooms or 125 rooms. the same level of staffing. That's the answer to your question. Thank you. My name is Diane Andrews, and my grandmother was born in Santa Monica. I am uh, in Ocean Park now. Um, I am a huge fan of you, Frank, and um, excited about the prospect. I understand the difficulty about the traffic, and I would like to propose an idea that just came to me, which might sound silly, and I nearly didn't stand up. <laughs> But it is the idea of underground um, pedestrian walkways um, based on the shape of the octopus. I know that sounds crazy, but if some of you could picture um, a way to bring people to the museum and then let them park off-site, I think that might be a better idea than having people turn down second and, you know, entry that way or the alley, I, I fear that there would be too many cars. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Christian Schultz. Uh, I'm a resident of Santa Monica for, I guess, 15 years now. Uh, I live in Ocean Park, and now for the past four years, I have an office on Montana. I have a design firm, and I just want to commend uh, Frank and his team on a great presentation. I've done these before. And this is probably the most detailed one I've seen in a long time. It's great. And uh, I drive by the site pretty much twice a day, every day. Um, I'm in and around the area four or five, three, four nights a week or during the day for lunch. And I can tell a lot of, uh, a lot of the people here that are concerned about height limits or about congestion, those are, those are valid concerns. But from the presentation from the FAR that Jeff and his team presented, it's a very slender, delicate, beautiful building, and as a resident and as a designer, I think I'm very excited to see what, what takes place and what comes forth. And my question um, would be is, I noticed there's, you're trying to incorporate a couple of different styles of buildings on the site. There's a, Tencho mentioned a, a Spanish colonial building, then there's a Victorian building, and then there's a lot of the rest of the blocky, horrible architecture that we see taking up the majority of Santa Monica. <laughs> Um, and, you know, I guess my only, I guess my question would be how do you, t how do you plan to tie those buildings together on the site at the, at the ground level or at the lower level? Or how do they have a language that kind of unites them? I totally plan to do it. I haven't been <laughs> able, it takes, it takes time to address all of those things, but, um, I promise I will. I mean, they're important to me too that the context be respected and that you don't uh, give the slight to your neighbor that you relate to it. Uh, I think if you look at the New York Tower, the most recent building, it's quintessentially New York. It does deal with the neighbors. It does respect the Woolworth Tower and all of those nice things. So I would, I've done that all my life. Uh, in fact, my house, which was chain link and corrugated, at the time, 
the guy across the street had two trailers in the backyard. He had a, a broken down car in the lawn on blocks. And he came over and said, I hate that. And I said, well, it looks like yours. <laughs> so I went a little too far with context. Just one, one more quick uh -huh. note. Um, uh, I just lost my train of thought. But anyway, I just, again, I wanted to commend you guys. I'm really excited to see what happens here. And, and uh, as, a, as a resident of the, uh, of the city, really excited to see what you guys do. And, and one other thing I just, that just came to my head is what was really interesting is all the different paseos or the plazas that you guys are bringing in. So it's essentially bringing in the city into the building. And I think that's great. It gives opportunity for residents like me that will be riding my bike there to have a place to park my bike and go use the restaurant or mm -hmm. go up to the roof deck. Uh, there's not many hotels that I know of that I've worked on that give half or a percentage of their roof back to the city. You know, that's usually not done. So I, I think that's great. Thanks. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sabine Lehmann. Uh, I'm a resident of Santa Monica and a business owner. I went to architectural graduate school, high tension. And uh, <laughs> um, I'm just so excited that Frank, you know, as a longtime resident of Santa Monica, you've finally been given the opportunity to build something significant, almost. <laughs> and uh, that it's a terrific opportunity. And I'm, I'm really coming from this uh, from a business perspective, um, from a marketing business perspective. Um, to draw more traffic to Santa Monica in tourism, um, to increase the economic situation, and how the building may actually be something that I, I mean, I, I'm more interested in, since, I mean, and I know that you have the ability to make something spectacular, to design something so spectacular that, um, that that's why people might come here. And maybe it has nothing to do with being tall and skinny, but that it be an icon or something that people decide to come to Santa Monica to see. And that is what I believe is the opportunity. So, you know, in, we, somebody earlier addressed, you know, what is your concept? Is it waves? Is it, you know, and so how is it that it will become something so you know, interesting that people might want to come to Santa Monica. That wasn't my question. Oh. Okay, but I got the waves thing. Well, you, you no, no, that's fine. I mean, I, yeah. So <laughs> I'm more, in, I'm interested in your concept and how it will make this magical building a Santa Monican building. And, you know, Santa Monicans are very special people, as we all can see. And uh, <laughs> we like different things, but, you know, we're very opinionated people. And uh, we want it to be beautiful, and we want it to be <coughs> ours. So how is it going to be that way? Frank. <laughs> if I could explain that in advance, I would, you know. When, when I went to Bilbao, they asked, it was a business decision by the city of Bilbao, the, the chamber, the commerce secretary, the education, the art, the cultural department, it, all of them, the mayor and, and the president of the Basque Country, asked me to do a building that did what the Sydney Opera House did for Sydney. Sydney, yeah. And uh, I said, you know, I, I don't know if I can do that. But you can. But I, in effect, I mean, if I, if I focused on that, I wouldn't have done it. Oh. it it's just too heavy a, a trip to try to digest and a responsibility. I'll do my best. <laughs> I've done pretty well. The city of Bilbao last year brought in 530 million euros in revenues to the city because of the museum, and it was 82% because of the visitors to the museum. Right. Jeff Gordon. Uh, my wife, Diana, who spoke before, and I spent five hours uh, across the river and walking around uh, your wonderful museum in Bilbao, watching the changing colors as the night came on and then went inside, saw all the Sarahs and everything. We love that. And what you said is exactly my understanding, that they wanted to bring in huge numbers of people and traffic and everything else. 
understand Santa Monica has a different needs. We are one of the most uh, heavily touristed place in the United States with the beach, the Third Street Promenade, uh, the pier. We have one of the most densely populated areas of housing because we have all the apartments <coughs> and condos. We have a huge workforce inflow into the city. We're one of the centers of work and employment. We have a college that is 30,000 people, 80% of whom, students, 80% of whom come from outside of the city. We have an airport. We have two major hospitals that are regional and national. This, I know, this little town, <laughs> unlike Bilbao, has all these people coming in. And one of the things that I think a lot of people here struggle with is, there's your proposed hotel, there's the one to the right of it, that's another, quote, opportunity site or anything goes site. There is the one that uh, Michael Dell, uh, who doesn't live in Santa Monica, I understand, is, is proposing. There are all of this development, 36 sites. And when you talk about having like two, 3,000 people a day coming to this site, all these driving, this gentleman who spoke before said he drives by twice a day. Well, there's going to be a lot more people doing that. And so we have tremendous concerns about that. And, uh, and that's why, you know, even though with all respect, and I know all of us admire you tremendously, and it's not about you, it's about the, uh, what we're going to have here is all of these other high buildings, all of these other low buildings that are dense, all of this dense, and uh, congestion and all of this added traffic and pollution which it brings that we already have. We're not talking about a small town that is a backward community, a, a suburb. We're talking about a very developed, very heavily uh, intellectual town with all of these uh, jobs and industries in it. And at a certain point, you, you got to say, do we build for every possible site, every possible uh, hotel room we could sell, every possible uh, new job we could bring in? Or do we let our neighbors in Venice and our neighbors uh, in uh, West LA and the other areas take a little bit of this uh, also uh, so that we're, you know, we're not, uh, uh, you know, we're not NIMBYs. We have it already. We have hundreds of thousands of people coming into our city, and the question is, are we going to double it? And that's, that's what we think. Uh, hi, I'm Amy Oxtacolmus. I'm a longtime Santa Monica resident. I'm also one of your neighbors, uh, and recently was uh, elected chair of our local neighborhood association, Northeast Neighbors. And, uh, Two things that I've been hearing from the community um, about this project. One, obviously very excited, not just a very well-known architect is going to be doing this project, but also one of our neighbors, and that's a delight. But the thing that I think gives people the most heartburn and the most pause and the feedback that I've been getting is the overwhelming concern over the height. Um, you know, obviously people have talked about one of the, the great benefits we have in this area is the ocean views. Um, and, uh, it, you know, it, it's... You know, me personally, something I'm struggling with is you're building a tall bar building and putting an observation deck on the top so people can see the ocean, but you're blocking the ocean to do that. Um, and so it seems to me, um, at least what I'm hearing from a lot of people in our community, it would be interesting to hear more about um, some of the alternative models that you said you have explored that are lower in scale that might uh, uh, alleviate that, that concern or that issue and whether that's something that's feasible for this type of project to do something iconic and really beautiful and, a, a, and that could be a nice tribute to our city and to, to one of our residents. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Is that a question? Yeah. I wasn't well, sure. My question would be uh, whether you can do it tonight or at a later date. Yeah, it'd be, yeah, it'd be I, difficult to do it tonight, obviously. On the spot about that. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. That of all those models, Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that 
I think that um, what we need to decide if, if, if some of these benefits are things that we want, uh -huh. I think lowering the height impacts some of those experiences. Someone that mentioned the Paseos, those get eaten up a little bit. Yeah. The museum itself will get eaten up. The use of those landmarks, someone asked about the prior development agreement on the three lots. It was a 73 room hotel, those landmark buildings were just engulfed by it. They very, literally, the facades were hanging out and the building was surrounding it. Mm -hmm. We've set them out separate and apart and made them active to the public. So those are things that we all have to weigh. I mean, and, but you know, we've looked at it and, and go ahead, I'm not gonna cut you off. No, I, all I can tell you is I've been here since 72, uh -huh. or earlier maybe. Nobody has come to me to do a smaller, <laughs> low building with architectural qualities. Nobody. Chayate. Chayate. Edgemar. 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 Yeah. That's three stories, right? Yeah. Not a hotel. Yeah. 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 Well, I can't speak for the history. I know. It's hard. To, yeah. yeah. I mean. I live up the street from Whole Foods, and that screwed my life up a bit. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Just a, a quick comment, and then I have a question on benefits. Um, Can you speak to the Sure, I'm sorry. As I look at the model that you have here, it seems backwards to me. You would think if you lived near the ocean, you would want the heights to be to the east as it, and it gets lower as you go west. And the way Santa Monica appears to be going is the opposite, that all the tall buildings are along the ocean and all the low stuff is back. That just seems counterintuitive. I'm not an artist or architect or anything, but I mean, as I look at it, it looks backwards. <laughs> That's really all I can say about that. So it's a comment. I don't expect you to, to think. But I did have a um, couple questions about benefits. Um, to me, there's a fine line between a benefit and a site amenity. So for instance, um, I look at some of the things and it says um, that it will create um, the museum. And I, I think you got some reaction. I'm not sure everybody thinks a museum is a great benefit. Yeah. We're all, you know, as you've heard, we're already very crowded. You know, if we have a, some kind of a big museum, we've got more people coming. So that's questionable. Uh, the historic preservation, and my understanding is if buildings are landmark, um, you can't destroy them. So I'm, mm -hmm. you know, I understand reusing, but I think they have to be preserved. Sure, I think there's two questions there. First yeah. on the okay. second one was the landmarks. The, what, what we've interpreted is what you do with them. Sure, we have landmarks. We have two of them. But how you activate them. Right now, they're mm -hmm. private facilities. Right. Um, what we're proposing to do is make them part of a public place. The, the other question we asked is about why the museum. It, it's really what came out of the, I mean, some people have said they don't want it. What we've heard is more people saying they wanted something cultural. So this is what we came up with. We're just reacting to what we've gotten from the downtown community workshops. Okay. And I, so we can't, unfortunately, I can't speak for 90,000 people. <laughs> and we're all just trying to figure out what we want as a group. And not everyone's going to want the same thing. But this is our reaction to what we've taken out of those. And they were numerous meetings. A lot of people attended those. So I that, was at them, yeah. So, I, I believe you. <laughs> okay, the other thing is, I look at the Paseos, and since it's a hotel and it's a museum... It's your third question, but I'm going to allow yeah, it. Yeah, well, I'm sorry, I said amenities, right. you had ten. <laughs> so, right. yeah, I'm, I have a okay. many-part question, I guess I should... Uh, many-part? Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, we have a lot of, of uh, so-called benefits here, or amenities. Um, I think that when there's a hotel involved, uh, I've done a, I used to be in sales and done a lot of things at hotels, and most of the hotels that have nice property uh, close it off for events. We've had private events that were, you know, outside if you're in California or Florida or somewhere like that. So uh, it, this is where I say there's a fine line between a site amenity and a public benefit because it's really an amenity for the hotel. You can have a wedding there, you can have big parties, you can have corporate events and just close it off to the public because it's not dedicated public land, right? 
Well, we hadn't thought about that, but the prior hotel that was entitled, uh, the 73 room hotel we referred to, did have some language in its development agreement about the ability to close off its public space. It, was, it had some limits on what it could do. Mm -hmm. We just, we're, that's further ahead from where we are today, okay. but I can assure you we're not um, proposing the cost of building a museum to close it off to the public because it would be empty. Okay. And uh, workforce and affordable housing, my yes. understanding is there's a certain amount required. Do you have anything over what's required? It's a because good question. I'm, I'm thinking if you're supposed to get extra things, there should be extra benefits. So tell me what the extra is. Yeah, there's, there's, the, you know, there's two types of affordable housing. There's low and very low. And I think that um, if our five units are very low, then yes, it's addition to what is required. Okay. okay. All right. And last really, one. We, okay. We've got oh, yeah, we got people oh, in line. Sorry, people. There was nobody when You're I You're right. There. Good. Okay. All right. Thank you, though. Hi, I'm uh, <clears throat> Steve Lanzarota. I went to high school here. My wife and I have lived and worked here parts of all past four decades, know Santa Monica very well. Um, I have a question and a comment. Has is, is any th um, study been given to what the arrival of the metro here will do to some of the mitigation of possible traffic increases? You know, that obviously is, a, is an issue for a traffic study, which we haven't done yet, but certainly it's, it's, it's our assumption that the expo is going to make a big impact on. Yeah, I would think it's within walking distance and, mm -hmm. you know, especially with traffic. Not only being is it difficult, it will be a, a huge incentive for people to use it. And I, and I assume our TDM plan will, um, will introduce the concept of doing shuttles if it's not in walking distance? Yeah. And the comment I have is just that um, I've had the privilege of working uh, at the Music Center the last nine years, Walt Disney Concert Hall, and I spent a lot of time in the building. And um, there's, a, there's not, either from the interior or the exterior, there's not one view that hasn't been thought through and isn't spectacular. I mean... May I have your attention, please? No. The library will be closing in half an hour at 9 p.m. The second floor restrooms will be closing in 15 minutes. Oh, boy. <laughs> That's good information. Card, please go to the customer service desk immediately. 1 p.m., the library will be closing in 30 minutes at 9 p.m. And the second floor restrooms will be closing in 15 minutes. Thank you. As you get older, that's the more important. Yeah. <laughs> the second one, I think, is the better notice, right? Well, anyway, I'll, I will <laughs> keep ahead. it short. <clears throat> My comment is that, um, you know, not only is Mr. Gary, I'm, he's not just one of the most famous architects in this state or in the country, but he's in the world. He's, you know, his talent is beyond what most of us can even think through, um, and I know that from looking at his building. Um, the fact that he lives here, this is an opportunity that shouldn't be missed. Um, you know, if we're to draw the line, this isn't the place to draw it, in my opinion. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, I did find it in the loose. It's Yay. downtown district goals and policies on in 2.6. <laughs> And I also wanted to mention a couple of things as far as benefits. I would expect that, the, that these jobs would be well paid enough that people who work them could actually live in Santa Monica. And that, cause that way it would really be a wonderful community benefit and would make any project be part of the community if people who work there can also live nearby and use transit or walk to work. The other thing is the observation deck should have access at least at, through most of the time that it's available. It should be free for people to go up to the observation deck. Yes, I can appreciate that you may well want a place for people to buy $7 soft drinks and $15 cocktails to help pay for it or whatever, but I would like to see the access to the view, which is, I'm sure, amazing, to be free to the people who live here. Thank you. Sure, two points. Yes. One is this is, a union, this is proposed as a union hotel, to answer your yes, first question. Yes, good. Right? The second point is we actually are not intending to sell alcohol at the observation. This is not okay. a hotel amenity. Yeah. This is a public amenity. And the reason that I think we should charge for it uh -huh. is because I think we need to
control the use of it. All the money we would get from charging mm -hmm. is going to the school district. So this is not money for us. But I think that there's a reason to charge for it. We haven't figured this out. We're far from thinking about this. There isn't yeah. one to go look at now, but that's mm -hmm. our initial thoughts. Okay, I, I hear you. I'm just saying that it needs to be something that's easily available to anyone. And affordable. Who, yes, easily affordable. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jerry Rubin. I, I agree. Uh, charge, get some money for the schools, but make it affordable for seniors. And mm -hmm. I wanted to ask about the observation deck I saw in the photo. You see it one way. I hope you have a view the other way, too. And the other is, how about lead development? How high a standard are you going? Are you going to have any solar panels on the roof <laughs> as well? I hope so, but just wanted to ask that. Joe, you want to take this? Sure. Uh, <laughs> lead is always a tricky question. Uh, one of the things that Frank mentioned earlier was about waste. Um, we work with a sustainability consultant on all of our projects, and they do do an analysis depending on the program, the location, to develop the right strategies. Uh, we have not completed that yet, so I can't tell you what are the best strategies for this climate. Uh, but one of the things that we do focus on, and it's not the most glamorous part, is waste. And what we do is we use this very sophisticated computer program to reduce waste in construction. And it's the single biggest area where you can impact the carbon footprint on a construction project. Did I hear you say that you're going for, like, platinum leads? <laughs> no, our, our last project we built was lead gold, and we intend to, to achieve that here. The, the, the problem is with lead, um, we're not even certain by the time this gets built if lead is still going to be the standard. So it's hard to – that would be our current thinking today is lead gold as it exists today. Okay. That's not actually not my question. Okay. Well, since, since Jerry Rubin gets to ask two, I get to ask two. You get to ask two as well. <laughs> I have a question about the museum, going back to the museum concept. Um, certainly it's a cultural amenity, but there are other cultural amenities that could be on that site, such as public art, um, that wouldn't attract people so much. Uh, and I'm curious if, if your thinking is advanced to the point yet of your thinking, are you have four different museum buildings or four different museums, is it all going to be one kind of museum? Um, and Hold Actually, on, I can't I, think all, you, now you yeah, have a second know. I'm trying to record okay. them all. Well, okay, just about that. There's just different kinds of uh, cultural aspects you can put in. Sure. And to address the woman who left here, obviously anything that Frank Gehry designs in Santa Monica is going to be iconic and it's going to be a destination and people are going to come here to look at it. And I think this building would be, um, I have other concerns about the building, but um, we do have the beach here. That's a big destination. But going, just talk about the museum and your concept. But you, you mentioned that you needed the 38,000 square feet to allow for the height. Is that because that is a low, well, yeah, I think, yeah, why do you need stuff. to have that much museum space, I guess, is sure. the question. Two Sorry things. to be so complicated. No, 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 I'm just, I took some notes, so I hopefully won't forget it all. Um, it's one museum. There's three buildings on the plaza level. Underneath the entire, underneath that entire three lot portion is, an, is the underground museum portion. So all three of those buildings are connected. It's all one. It's all one. One museum. Not that long ago, that was a sculpture garden. We were just going to put sculptures out there. And I figured I'd probably go by as a resident. I'd probably go by once, and he'd go by once. And we didn't think that was enough. I can tell you, it'd be a lot cheaper for me to put in six sculptures and walk away from it and not worry about how it's going to operate. But th we didn't think that was enough. So. Um, that's the thing behind the museum. Is, it, is there other community, I mean, cultural? Sure, there's other ideas. Why 36,000 feet? It's because it needs to be substantial in size for it to work. There's an, someone already mentioned there's a lot of existing people in Santa Monica already. What we're doing is trying to create another venue for them. We have an existing tourism population, but also have an existing resident population. The residents would come back to this more than once. The sculpture garden is not going to be a lasting experience. Please? I just want, uh, when I mentioned the Bilbao stuff, I was asked the question specifically about that pertained to that issue. Of, of, um, the, you can take this argument and say, well, if you build uglier buildings, nobody will want to come. <laughs> and so you can go down that path. 
<laughs> and, and I think there have been a lot of ugly buildings, and that sometimes there's buildings that we have pride in, like the library downtown. And there's a few things around, Frank Lloyd Wright, but Frank Lloyd Wright is being trashed. Um, I don't think this is about about that. It's right. You have the ocean. We have all the nice things. We don't need anything. Uh, we don't need any ego trip from Frank Gehry, and I'm not planning to do an ego trip. We're just, I'm trying to deal with a program, a particular building type, and make it a fairly modest uh, attempt, but to have some dignity, to have some feeling, to be, have a humanistic quality to it instead of like the century city buildings that you see all around the world. Everywhere you go, you see them. And so Santa Monica is a particular character. I'm trying to relate to it. I'm not trying to make a Bilbao effect here. I'm not at all. I think this might be our last question so everybody can go to the bathroom <laughs> and um, be able to get out of here before they shut the doors. I would like to know at the current site, as of, you have said that about Boa restaurant and above there are as well as some rooms and so on. How many affordable housing is there already? So, I mean, is there, tr as a, do you have currently affordable housing? So what you are proposing is only kind of a rollover into the new project or how does it look? And then the next thing is as well, I mean, we have currently already, I think the city is getting to a point where we maybe get problems as well with electricity and the solar cell or the solar panels was not really a joke in my eyes. Um, we have brownouts and if we get all these projects going, I think we will get to a point where we maybe have some great buildings but no power, so <laughs> it's not worth anything to us all. Um, we have no affordable uh, units on the site today. Okay, because I didn't know. No, no, I appreciate the question. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming and being part of this process. We'll continue to have community meetings and we'll continue to go through the process. Thank you.